-hmm. How much more spiritually connected could we be than this moment where we're all experiencing suffering, some, some vibrational and suffering on some level across the whole world? I just find that amazing. It gets all intertwined. And I think there's a level of fatigue among people right now, too, because I think it's, as Amy said, this is a worldwide event that everyone's going through. And it's taxing, I think, to be. Thank you for joining me today. My name is Erica Randolph. I'm a licensed professional clinical counselor. And today I have two wonderful guests in the studio with me today, Margaret Ann Knight and Amy Axtell. And Amy and Mark have a counseling practice called A Center for Change. It is located at Speedway in Tucson. And they joined me today and to talk about what they offer as therapists, but also what they are offering to clients to deal with the COVID-19 that is affecting all of us on so many levels. So please join me today and hear from Amy and Margaret. so much for joining me today. I really am looking forward to getting to know you and find out what you do. And I've heard good things about both of you and I'm excited to learn about you. So Amy, why don't you tell me a little bit about how long you've been in Tucson and what you do? Oh, well, I've been in Tucson longer than I've been a therapist in Tucson. I came here in 1983, but I've been in private practice for 30 years. And I mostly work with an adult population. I have kind of garden variety issues that come through my practice, but I have a couple of areas of specialty. One is eating disorders, the other is relationships. And then I work with depression, anxiety, transition, um, aging, grief. Don't do kids, do some family. Mm -hmm. And so- more. <laughs> yeah. So, so you were saying, um, just to make sure that we're hearing that, um, uh, eating disorders is a specialty, and, yes. um, as well as dealing with grief and loss and depression and anxiety and, and relationships. I do a lot of couples work, a lot of which, couples work, which I'm really passionate about. It's one of my favorite things to do. Awesome. Yeah. Um, Me too. Okay, and Margaret, what do you do? What's your background? What? Um, I actually grew up here. My dad was in the Air Force and got stationed here in 1963. So I've been here since I was six, seven. Um, went to university, then uh, knocked around a little bit. I did a musician thing like you, you did and like Amy's husband did. Yeah. Worked in theater, uh, did a bunch of other stuff, and then in 89, 90, went back to grad school, got a master's degree in counseling and guidance that's where i met amy um, i am a licensed professional counselor licensed independent substance abuse counselor so i have additional training in working with addictions and addictive processes um, like amy i've done training to do couples work i do work with kids i don't work with a lot of them but if it's appropriate and i'm working with the family i work with kids i love working with teenagers um, i think and amy will will back me on this a lot of what we wind up doing is is work that stems from some sort of trauma in the background and certainly grief. So we both have training doing that. Um, and so pretty much like Amy said, anything that walks in the door, I'm really happy to meet with from adults down to little kids. And, and you, you both have an office in the same building. You share a building or? We share. We have, a, we have a really lovely little office in a complex at Speedway in Tucson. So there's a, it's a little courtyard stucco office complex we rent one of the offices and we sublet to two other counselors and we each have our own offices in here amy, amy is my work wife she's your what my work wife your work wife okay <laughs> so you guys have been working together for a long time we've we shared have. we've been uh, i think sharing space close to 20 years in two different locations wow. true Wow, so you have a long work history together. You guys have known each other and been friends for a long time. And we've often referred back and forth within our practices. Sometimes, you know, if we're having, um, for instance, I might be working with a couple and one of the members of the couple maybe needs some additional help. I may refer that person to Margaret. 
sometimes we divide couples and then we get together and do some conjoint appointments. Sometimes we do some family work together. Um, we've sort of visited those things over the years. Wow, that's really cool. That's really good to have that kind of mutual support for each other, that you care for each other, your friends, and you can support each other in this way with your clients. And that gives a more holistic approach for your clients as well, I'm imagining. It really, it really does. We've actually formed a group of friends. Amy and I met in grad school, and there are a couple of the people that we met in grad school that we still work with. We have another set of friends that we've met through various ways, probably what are we, eight brujas, six brujas? We have a group that we nicknamed Las Brujas because nice. we meet together and we consult and they're all people that we've worked with and trained with long enough that we trust and we refer back and forth. And it's really lovely to have a community like that. And, and we're always looking for other people that kind of we click with and come into the community. Well, that sounds really, really awesome. The other, the other thing I think allows Margaret and I to do the sharing of clients sometimes is I think we kind of have a similar philosophy and a similar approach to this work, which helps, you know, sometimes Very much. you're not really in alignment per se with another counselor's perspective on something. It gets tricky to try to collaborate. So that's been a blessing. Well, thank you. That reminds me of the next question I want to ask you. What is your philosophy and what, what is your um, therapeutic um, theory that you I see myself sort of as somebody who uses developmental theory the most, meaning that I really, regardless of what issue is in front of me, I really try to look for the places where the person has gotten stuck in their development, somewhere along the line, probe that a little bit, figure out what's their trauma, their an event, what keeps them stuck there, what has the stuckness done to prevent them from flourishing or becoming the person that they want to become. So that's sort of how I look, the lens probably I use the most. And certainly that fits with eating disorders. You know, there's a lot of arrested development with eating disorders and addiction, so. Awesome. Very much so, that's, that's pretty much my approach as well. I think part of that's because we've, we've gone to school and trained together. Um, just philosophically, it really, really fits. Um, it, I, I remember, I, I'm a recovering addict, so before I, I went to school, that happened and then never dreaming I would be doing this work I wound up being in grad school and then denying that I would ever work with substance abuse issues I wound up doing a practicum and then I realized oh I'm, I'm good at this and I really love doing it and the developmental approach started recurring to me even early in recovery is like I remember feeling like I was about three years old at, in the very beginning mm. and that I didn't have a lot of skills and a lot of tools and then I was growing up the longer I stayed clean and sober um, that fit really nicely with the stuff that we studied in school and the ways that we've trained um, by way, like Amy is saying, of noticing, oh, this is a place I didn't get the tools. This is a place where I didn't have adults that modeled this piece or that piece. This is a place where um, now I can look with clients and go, okay, this isn't you being broken or, or sick. This is about figuring out what pieces did you not get and how do we help you find those pieces and how do you how do we help you which really kind of dovetails with the COVID piece uh, I think an important thing that we both agree on is we're helping people learn to be able to tolerate discomfort to tolerate stuff that in the past they might have used food or alcohol or gambling or relationships or anything else to try to dis distract themselves from. And now it's about, can you tolerate uncertainty and discomfort? Because that's a lot of what life is, and it certainly is what life is now with COVID. So speaking of that, Margaret, that's really interesting, I think. Um, what are some of the tools that you help people use to be able to tolerate the discomfort? Well, for me, it, um, I do sort of cognitive work where we're, I talk with people about what is your brain telling you? How is your brain making meaning out of this? And what is it saying to you? And can you begin to talk back to your mind in a different way? If, you're, if your mind is giving you a ne negative message about yourself or about what's happening to you, can you come up with a different script to talk back to it? Mm -hmm. And by doing that, can you learn to soothe yourself instead of trying to get other people or other things to soothe you? Mm -hmm. So that's a big piece of it. And then a lot of the things get thrown in, you know, with, with whatever people's coping skills are. Mm -hmm. Amy? Amy. I'm, um, well, a couple of things. I certainly am looking 
looking at some of that too, people's narrative, you know, what meaning they're assigning to what's happening. Um, but a couple things have occurred to me about COVID specifically. One is that and I'm addressing this with clients pretty much every hour in some way or another. We're getting fed this constant stream of information that's orienting us to the future. Mm -hmm. You know, the peak will be here, you know, the, the sort of always future scaping, getting us to think about re-entry when we open up the country again, what's it gonna be like? And what I feel is happening is it's really hijacking people's brains. We're really in anxiety all the time because we're not really able to be present because the present is chaotic for a lot of people. It's very fraught. People, I have clients who are sending me pictures of their homes just to say, I need the validation. My home is a wreck because I'm, I'm homeschooling my kids now. My husband's furloughed my, my, you know, whatever the particulars are in people's homes, everything feels like it's falling apart. So people are very, very much in their anxiety brain right now. And so I'm helping people think about how to get mindful, how to get, how to get here. Um, mm -hmm. Some of it is physical, you know, teaching some basic breathing exercises, um, helping people with some um, brain hacks like tapping and slowing down how information and messages are recorded in what part of the brain. And just really also trying to get people to do a very simple gratitude list every day. Today, I am well. Today, my partner is well. Today, I have a roof over my head. You know, trying to get people to sort of stay with the data they have now. Because everything in the future, we don't know. And I think it's going to continue to evolve in very um, uncertain ways. So. I love it. Yeah, I think it's and I think it's also important. People have been coming into our offices, and we talk about this with our colleagues. People who have never really experienced anxiety before saying, "I'm feeling anxious, and I don't know why." Mm. Um, I, there's less of that as this has gone on, but certainly I think people who have not been used to that. And I think there's also a way that we try to normalize that. Like this is a time when everybody's feeling uncertain. This is a time where everybody's feeling anxious. Also, to sort of go along with Amy's stuff, I, I want to know from people and clients that I've worked with for a while, I, I get this, but your, your places and the things that you've done that you cope with are gone. You can't go out and listen to music right now. You can't go to the gym and work out like you always have. For my people in recovery, you can't go to AA meetings. You can't go to NA meetings. Um, they're happening online and they're on Zoom, but that's a really, really different thing. And there are some folks who aren't really up on the, the technology curve and it's kind of intimidating. I think in recovery, um, so, so part of it is like being able to say to people, so then how do you get outside and go for a walk? How do you find a way to exercise? If, you're, if yoga is your coping strategy, are you looking for yoga on YouTube? Are you looking for online classes? Um, and with recovery, I'm noticing the longer term people, the people who have a foundation in it, seem to be doing fairly well and they're adjusting to Zoom meetings and they have people they can talk to on the phone. But this has been really destabilizing for people who are in early recovery or who are just mm -hmm. thinking about whether or not they need to take a look at their behavior. And obviously for, for a lot of people, alcohol, pot, other drugs, they're, they're coping strategies. And that's, that's a really tough piece right now for people, I think, because there isn't a sense of stability with it. I really appreciate that. Go ahead, Amy. Um, I was just going to add the other, the other thing that I'm noticing is really pervasive for all clients that I'm working with in some form or another is just grief. There's so much. Oh, yes. There is. I mean, you know, when, whether we're looking at the obvious examples of, of seniors, whether they are seniors in high school, seniors in college who are grieving the loss of their ceremonies, you know, their graduations, their proms. Um, you know, I've got clients who had wedding dates this spring, you know, people that um, aren't able to see aging grandparents. Um, I had a client today and virtually of the session was spent just sitting with her when she sobbed because she was just experiencing all of her colleagues being furloughed while she was the one person that they kept on and just losing your tribe and losing all those layers for everybody people losing money economic security um, having to deal with kids loss while you're dealing with your own it's just so much collective breathing 
I'm also just interested because I'm sort of an eternal optimist. If I'm if I'm naturally inclined in one direction, it's that direction. I sort of feel like there's this fascinating aspect of how it's very so collective, right? When have we ever historically had an experience where the whole world is responding at the same time to the same right. stuff? I sometimes go to sleep at night and I close my eyes and I try to I think can I can I feel the the heartbeat of the world right now? Like it just feels so collective to me and all of us. Very much. And that's it's interesting because I think the other thing that I'm seeing, grief is huge. Um, and as probably a result, what falls from that is sleep disorders. So people who have never had trouble sleeping are finding it difficult. So being able to talk with people about sleep hygiene and maybe you never needed a routine to go to sleep before, but now you do. And people are reporting that when they do sleep, they're having dreams that they remember, that they haven't really remembered or they're vivid. And in the dreams, they're doing the work of grieving. And in the dreams, they're doing the work of dealing with fear. So it, it gets all intertwined. And I think there's a level of fatigue among people right now, too, because I think it's, as Amy said, this is a worldwide event that everyone's going through. And it's taxing, I think, to be so aware of where it is everywhere and not just in your own life. And your own life has got plenty of stuff that's going to tax you anyway. Well, that's a lot of wisdom from all, from both of you on just so many levels there, just the levels of the addiction, the grief, the eating, um, the sleep disorders, and I mean, all those different aspects that you're seeing people coming in, and I really love that image you gave, Amy, of laying in bed and wondering if you can hear, hear the heartbeat of the earth. Because you're right, the whole world is going through this right now. It's, just, it's wild. Yeah. I mean, it just, to me, that's like the miracle of this, that if we wanted to think, you know, I use this word loosely in terms of how I would define it, but some degree of spiritual connection, mm -hmm. how much more spiritually connected could we be than this moment where we're all experiencing suffering, some, some vibrational and suffering on some level across the whole world. I just find that amazing. And simultaneously, our earth is healing and animals are thriving and, you know, climate change is getting a break. The air is clear in Beijing. Yes, right. I, I have dear friends who live in Hong Kong and they are showing photographs for the first time in all the years they've lived there with sunny skies. And I just and sit like, islands they haven't seen. Yeah. It's amazing. That is really, really amazing. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, I love the idea of thinking about the spirituality of it. I mean, because it's true, there's a connection that we're having on a sub, sub like you know, the Jungian uh, collective. Collective yeah, yeah. Yeah, right? It's like, I hadn't thought about it that way, but when you said that, I actually got shivers. You know, <laughs> I was like, ooh, I got shivers with that one. <laughs> she does that to me all the time. Does she? It's <laughs> <laughs> <She's> the shivers. <laughs> Awesome. Worth the wisdom. <laughs> so in, in light of all these different things that you're seeing coming in, and we kind of touched on it before, but maybe are there a few things that, um, I mean, there's sleep hygiene, you know, being careful about how we sleep and all that, but what would be some, some of the things that maybe we haven't spoken about that would be helpful for people to just maybe think about doing? What would you say, Amy? I, I, was just, I was just thinking about this the last couple of days, and Margaret and I started to chat about this before we jumped on here with you. Mm -hmm. I, I've been almost putting out a little warning to my clients and friends, and I, I hope I'm wrong about it, but I'm kind of looking at this first phase that people have been in as sort of this anxiety phase. And I, I've said to a number of people, we're probably having this adrenaline dump now and people are gonna slide a little more into depression and fatigue, Margaret, you just mentioned that. Mm -hmm. Just feeling wearying, right? We're getting weary of not seeing our friends or weary of the economic strains. And I really feel a slight concern that as we start to open things up, you know, people have now, developed a healthy respect for keeping distant from infection, right? Mm -hmm. Washing your hands. So we start to open the world up and there are certain things that we all do culturally that put us in close proximity with other people. 
and I'm feeling a little worried about the, a certain heightened level of aggression. You know, when people start to gather and people are in close proximity and maybe pushing up against each other again, are people going to push physically or be more vocal? There's a certain element of policing that's going on, you know, between different factions of friends and family in terms of what people are starting to do or have been doing. Like, you know, are you wearing masks to the grocery store? Are you wearing gloves? Are you, you know, there's, there's a continuum, right? Of, of people who, some people who are doing nothing, some people who are doing everything. And so I'm just feeling like there's likely to be some elevated reactivity. And I think people need to be thinking about that. Do you think that's partly based in fear or where do you think that's coming from? I think there's going to be fear. And I think, you know, it's, it's one thing to be afraid of seeing other people when you're not doing it. Mm -hmm. It's another thing to carry that fear back out into the world when you're interacting with people. Right. You know, I'm, I'm just sort of watching how people are even at the grocery store. You know, some people are just naturally moving away from you, even if you're maintaining some distance. Mm -hmm. Margaret told me a story about uh, her sister in Costco this morning. Somebody, you know, people are just sort of aggressive. Bark at her. You need to step back from me. You yeah. can tell the story. Yeah. Well, she was just in Costco and she was across uh, one of the clothing tables from somebody else with, and they all had their carts. And a woman just started barking at her about that she was standing too close. And if you know anything about Costco, those, there's not really a lot of places you can stand other than where you stand. Um, and that was that was kind of scary to me. But what also fascinated me, the part of the story, was a woman across a different table looked at the person who was barking and said, that's not okay to do. That is absolutely not okay to do. We're all doing the best that we can. And so I think to riff on Amy, I do worry about the pent-up fear and the possible aggression. I, I, I feel like this is also something that's been highly politicized, and that's going to have a huge effect on on whether people come out of this and start to open things up and how we see each other. So one of the things that I talk to clients about, and I know Amy does as well, is how do you be your best self? How do you show up as the person that you want to be? And even if you haven't necessarily felt like you were being your best, can you find your best self? Can you show up in these really hard situations? And I think it's going to be super important as the world begins to open up how that happens. To bear in mind what we talked about earlier about where's, what's our, what are we grateful for? And what have we missed and what do we get to take back and be more grateful for? But also, can you walk out in the world, even if you're scared or ticked off or uncertain, and be your best self? in those situations when you feel even when you feel fear or anger can you do that from your best self i really love that i really appreciate what you guys are saying about that because you're right the polit politicization of what's been going on how it's been so politicized and and you know the way that that raises people's cortisol levels basically you know, yes them, you know yeah. heightened awareness heightened fight or flight and right right Yes. And without our normal places to release cortisol, like the gym or yoga class or right. a watch date with a friend, right? Mm -hmm. So everyone's going to be, it's sort of like caged tigers being released. That's what I'm feeling. <laughs> but, you know, I did say earlier, I'm an eternal optimist and I am. So I'm also looking at the blessings and I think there's been <laughs> tremendous amount of kindness shown. People are really, I see just so many examples of people reaching out and doing extra stuff for neighbors and friends. Yeah. Also that that's just been lovely to see. Yeah. I adore the, the bear hunt. Have you heard about the bear hunt? No. There are neighbors, this, I don't know where this started. I know that there are several neighborhoods, including mine and Sam Hughes, where, they're, where people are doing this. Because kids are home and folk, parents are taking their kids out for a walk, people have started putting stuffed bears in their windows that face the street. So that when the little kids go out for walks, or big kids even, they're going on a bear hunt and they're looking for the bears in the windows. They're looking and people have put, if I walk around the neighborhood, people have put the stuffed animals on top of their light posts if they don't have a window or they've put them. And I mean, there's so many things about that, taking care of the kids because Lord God, kids are just in the, I, I think they're the most vulnerable always, but right now everything's upside down. 
Um, I think parents, it, it's delightful to see parents being home and all my clients are talking about the joy of that, but it, I mean, there's just also so much more to do. So going out for a walk and looking for bears and stuffed animals in windows and counting them and talking about, oh, we found that, you know, that kind of thing that we do for each other. I think I've noticed people, when, when I walk through the neighborhood, if I'm on the other side of the street, giving a wave or a hi or how are you, remembering that cortisol and norepinephrine and all those chemicals, they don't just go away all of a sudden. We have to, like Amy was saying, that we're not doing the things we can to excise them as much, but they also last anyway. So bearing in mind, our systems are going to be off. They're going to be rattled. So looking for things like stuffed bears that delight you, looking for things like people being kind that delight you. That to me is important. That's and I yay bear hunt. In my neighborhood and the surrounding neighborhood, different part of town, I've noticed little stone shrines. People are doing these little stone shrines with stones on top of each other, sort of symbolic of connectivity and holding each other up, which is just, you know, amazing. Oh, that's beautiful. Also, actually, by the way, I just posted on my Facebook Erica Randolph counseling page it's, um, a story to be used with children that um, I love it. It's a, you can click on that link and it takes you to the story and you can download it and use it for helping children to deal with the COVID-19. Oh, that's lovely. That's but, awesome. But then we'll have, we'll have to get together so we can have more referral time. I know, I think so too. I would love to get to know you two much, much better. This little intro is to me just making me feel like, oh my God, maybe I can find some of my tribe here in Tucson. But thank you so much for joining me today. And thank, you thank you again. So Amy, give us your whole name. Amy Axel. Axel. Mm -hmm. Amy Axel and Margaret. And I'm Margaret Ann Knight. And, how and the, the you? office that we are in, we just have a name, but it's in the phone book. Our names are in the phone book. They're online. We also have an office name that's a center for change. Center you can for also change. find us that way. Okay. We've got a Facebook page somewhere. We've advertised in the yellow pages over the years, and most of our referrals, frankly, are word of mouth. We've been in practice. We're, we're like old people in this town. <laughs> <laughs> I look forward to talking with you again soon. We will do that. Thank you for this. <laughs>